Hi. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Chris Johnson, and I'm the director of the Attleboro Public Library and a co-chair, along with Rusty Dracante, of Attleboro's 1ABC committee. Our committee is comprised of a dedicated group of community partners, including the Attleboro Arts Museum, the Attleboro Industrial Museum, Attleboro Public Schools, Bishop Fian High School, the Attleboro Land Trust, Bridgewater State University, Bristol Community College, the Community VNA, and the Literacy Center. And we also have great support from our media partners, AACS, The Sun Chronicle, and AARA Radio. When our committee was meeting last November and December to plan our annual NEA Big Read grant submission, we obviously did not know how different our community and our world would be just one year later. One ABC stands for one adventure, one book, and one community. And this year's selection of Circe, I'll hold it up over here, <laughs> by author Madeline Miller, as our NEA Big Read Attleboro title for 2020, has certainly provided us with an amazing book, a fun and unusual adventure, and has brought our community closer through the magic of the internet to meet the NEA's goal of bringing readers together to an explore and discuss a great book. The NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment of the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Thanks to their generous funding, we are pleased to have provided nearly 700 copies of Circe throughout the greater Attleboro community. And this year we're able to do so uh, in both English, Spanish, and French. This grant is also making this evening's discussion with the author Madeline Miller possible. I would also like to thank our other program funding partners, Bristol County Savings Bank, Bank the Attleboro Cultural Council, the Rotary Club of Attleboro, and the friends and trustees of the Attleboro Public Library. Each has helped to fund the over 25 events and book discussions that are occurring in celebration of Circe. And just a reminder that even though this is our keynote for the grant, our programs will continue through October 22nd, including the wonderful online art exhibit at the Attleboro Arts Museum. If you have not gotten a chance to see that, I encourage you to visit their website and click on the link for Scylla. And please do visit the NEA Big Read Attleboro website. It's at attleboros1abc.org to continue the adventure. A special thank you to Dr. Kevin Kalish for volunteering to moderate this evening's discussion. Thank you also to Cassie Riva and Kim Havens, along with Emily Crow of An Unlikely Story for making our virtual hosting possible. Thank you all. And finally, thank you to author Madeline Miller, along with her representative, Christy Henricks. Thank you to Madeline for taking some time to visit with us this evening and providing us with Circe, an unforgettable read. I hope you enjoyed this evening's uh, discussion. Awesome. Whoop. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fantastic. We are so excited to be here. So my name is Kim Havens. I am the event manager at An Unlikely Story. And um, just welcome. This is so fantastic. If you have any troubles with your connection, um, if your picture gets blurry, just click on the help button and choose compatibility mode. And if you lose your connection, lose your sound, just go ahead, sit right out and jump right back in. First of all, I would like to thank Authors Unbound and the Attleboro Public Library for inviting us to partner with them this evening. We are so delighted to be part of this team and it, this is an absolute dream. Uh, Madeline Miller grew up in New York City and Philadelphia. She attended Brown University, where she earned her BA and MA in Classics. She has taught and tutored Latin, Greek, and Shakespeare to high school students for over 15 years. She's also studied at the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and in the Dramaturgy Department at Yale School of Drama, where she focused on the adaptation of classical texts to modern forms. The Song of Achilles, her first amazing novel, was awarded the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction and was also a New York Times bestseller. Miller was also shortlisted for the 2012 Stonewall Writer of the Year. Her second novel, Circe, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and won the Indies Choice Best Adult Fiction of the Year Award and the Indies Choice Best Audiobook of the Year Award, as well as being shortlisted for the 2019 Women's Prize for Fiction. Oh, no sound. Okay. Um, 
Cersei also won the Red Tentacle Award, an American Library Association Alex Award, Adult Books of Special Interest to Teen Readers, and the 2018 L Big Book Award. It is currently being adapted. I was so tickled to death to find out as for a series with HBO Max. Miller's novels have been translated into over 25 languages, including Dutch, Mandarin, Japanese, Turkish, Arabic, and Greek. And her essays have appeared in a number of publications, including The Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Telegraph, Lapham's Quarterly, and NPR.org. And she is joining us from outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where she lives. So now it is my distinct honor to welcome Madeline Miller virtually to the stage with Dr. Kevin Kalish. Hi, Madeline, welcome. Hello, thank you. you I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, so Madeline, could you start with reading a short passage from your novel? Sure, I would be delighted. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you to everyone for, for reading. Um, thank you to Attleboro for having me here. Book Independent bookstores and libraries are basically my two happy places. So getting to combine them is really exciting. Um, and I absolutely, I don't know if any of the artists are out there, but I did get to go look at the online art exhibit and it was incredible. I loved it. So thank you all. And I highly recommend if you haven't seen it to, to go check it out. Um, and the passage I'm going to read comes from uh, towards the middle of the novel after Circe, who is famous in Greek mythology for turning men into pigs, has started turning men into pigs. And the he in this passage is Odysseus. He asked me once, why pigs? We were seated before my hearth in our usual chairs. He liked the one draped in cowhide with silver inlaid in its carvings. Sometimes he would rub the scrolling absently beneath his thumb. Why not? I said. He gave me a bare smile. I mean it. I would like to know. I knew he meant it. He was not a pious man, but the seeking out of things hidden. This was his highest worship. There were answers in me. I felt them very deep as last year's bulbs growing fat. Their roots tangled with those moments I had spent against the wall when my lions were gone and my spells shut up inside me. After I changed a crew, I would watch them, scrabbling and crying in the sty, falling over each other, stupid with their horror. They hated it all, their newly voluptuous flesh, their delicate split trotters, their swollen bellies dragging in the earth's muck. It was a humiliation, a debasement. They were sick with longing for their hands, those appendages men use to mitigate the world. Come, I would say to them, it's not that bad. You should appreciate a pig's advantages. Mud slick and swift, they are hard to catch. Low to the ground, they cannot easily be knocked over. They are not like dogs. They do not need your love. They can thrive anywhere on anything, scraps and trash. They look witless and dull, which lulls their enemies, but they are clever. They will remember your face. They never listened. The truth is, men make terrible pigs. Wow, that was just a wonderful passage to get us started and, and so lyrical. Um, I feel like we could just spend the time having you read to us, um, but I think we want to also discuss um, and, and talk about the book um, because this is such a, a great opportunity and such a, a privilege to be able to be together even during a pandemic, even when we're all suffering some isolation and to gather together to discuss good books. Um, and so what a great program this is. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Big Read um, that brings us together, the Attleboro Public Library and all the other co-sponsors. Um, and for, for me in particular, this is so exciting to be here talking with you, um, having taught your books in some of my courses at Bridgewater State University. 
uh, it's a rare privilege, especially when you teach classical literature, to engage in a conversation with an author whose books you have taught. Um, and a little bit later, we'll also hear from some high school students from Bishop Fian High School. Um, but my first few questions um, are a bit more general, but then I want to get into some real um, real nitty gritty with the, uh, with the ancient sources. And I'll, I'll try to restrain myself though from you know, completely nerding out about these, <laughs> these classical texts. Um, so for, for those of you who have not yet read Circe, because I'm sure if you haven't yet, you will after tonight, um, the, the story comes from Homer's Odyssey, an epic poem from ancient Greece about Odysseus's return home after the Trojan War. On that journey, he and his companions land on this island inhabited by Circe, and she turns his men into pigs, as we just heard so beautifully. And Homer tells us really nothing about Circe's background, and it is Odysseus's story, right? Because during this part of the poem, Odysseus is the narrator. It's, so it's Circe through his voice. But your Circe is, is more than just a retelling of Homer's story. Instead, we hear Circe's story in her own words, and we learn of her life before and after the events that we know from the Odyssey. So my first question for you, Madeline, why stories from ancient Greece? How are they relevant for us today? Well, my relationship to these stories really goes back a, a long way. They were something that I loved from when I was a child. Um, and I, I think what I loved about the stories then is, is really the same thing I, I love about them today, which is I love how it feels like those 3,000 years separating us from them just vanish when you start reading them. And, you know, when we look at the Odyssey, if you take out the gods and the monsters, this is really the story of an exhausted war veteran who is desperate to get home to his family. And when he finally gets home, he finds it harder to re-enter his old life than he thought it was going to be. And that's a story that I think we could tell at pretty much any point in human history. And then if we even kind of go a step further out, we can say, you know, this is the story of someone who is lost far from home and alienated from everything around them and doesn't know if they're ever going to be home again. And in the Greek, Odysseus is longing for his nostos, is the word, his homecoming, which is where we get our English word nostalgia, it's the pain of, of wanting homecoming, um, that sort of pang we feel when we feel like we're far from home and we're thinking about home. And so to me, it always just felt incredibly timeless. You know, I would look at these stories and, and they would just feel so real to me. And I think that at the same time that I was loving them and studying them, because as soon as I could take Latin, I did. And then I was lucky to have a wonderful Latin teacher who taught me Greek. And so I knew kind of heading off to college that I wanted to study Greek and I wanted to study this, this amazing poetry. But I think that part of what I couldn't help but notice at the same time that I was loving it and feeling like it was so timeless, I was also feeling really frustrated with it. <laughs> I was feeling like there are so many voices that are being drowned out. And, you know, with very few exceptions, the people who are telling these stories whose voices have survived from the ancient world are male aristocrats. So we're just getting a very small little window into the ancient experience. And the female characters in particular are often very flattened, very sidelined, um, and, you know, really kind of viewed through a very simplistic lens if they get to have a story at all. And so at the same time that I was loving it, I kind of wanted to push back against it. So I was doing that in the context of academic work. And then I had this epiphany that actually what I wanted to say, this is about before my first novel, what I wanted to say about Achilles and Patroclus, actually, I didn't want to say it um, in a paper. I wanted to say it in a novel. And so that I sort of never looked back <laughs> from then. Okay. So a, a combination of, of, of love, admiration, but also frustration. Yeah. And I mean, would you see your work as part of a, a larger trend? Because I'm thinking of other recent works that have also 
in particular, given voice to these women who don't really have a voice in the ancient text. So like Pat Barker's recent books, um, Silence of the Girls, um, Margaret Atwood, or um, and even, you know, today we just heard the news that um, Louise Glick mm -hmm. uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. And she also, though in poetry, engages with these, with these ancient stories. So do you see your work as part of a kind of larger movement, maybe? I do, um, although I would, I would even extend that movement and trace it all the way back to the ancient world. Mm. That one of the reasons I, I kind of like to start with the reading is that the Iliad and the Odyssey themselves came out of oral tradition. And so initially they were performed by bards who were singing them um, and who were you know, accompanied by music and the audience was sitting there listening to them and the bards would change them and adapt them depending on the audience. And at some point they coalesced around a text and we tend to think of them as a book that we you know, take off the shelf today, but that was not their initial form. And as soon as um, the Iliad and the Odyssey you know, existed, they were being told and retold and played with and you know, there is no definitive version of these stories. In the ancient world, there was Homer's version, but then there was Aeschylus's version and, you know, Virgil's version and Ovid's version. And then kind of down through through the centuries, Shakespeare's version, Chaucer's version, Margaret Atwood's version, James Joyce's version. And so I feel like that that tradition of retelling actually is sort of unbroken from ancient times. And that that's what's so exciting is that um, these myths are so vivid and filled with so much that you can, you know, always find a new angle on them and, and a new sort of truth in them and a new character whose voice hasn't hasn't spoken before. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, going back to what you're saying about the oral performance of these works in antiquity, um, and I'm just thinking, how do things change? when you take something that was composed as epic poetry and then you cast it in the form of the novel. So does the, the very form and the structure of the novel give you a certain freedom in how you are reimagining Circe's story? Absolutely. And um, I credit a lot of my sort of knowledge about storytelling and writing actually from directing Shakespeare plays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was sort of the, the thing that uh, finally allowed me to realize that I wanted to write about classics in a, in a um, fiction way, mm -hmm. which is that I directed Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. And if any of you are interested in, in sort of reading another take on these myths, I highly recommend Troilus and Cressida. It's angry and funny and nasty. And Shakespeare really lets all these characters have it. Helen, Agamemnon, Achilles, they're all in there. And um, it was the first time directing it that I was really kind of shaping it myself i was shaping the story myself and you know talking to achilles about his motivations and and working through all of that and so it it made me realize that i wanted to i wanted to write about this but the other thing that i loved from shakespeare is that shakespeare really digs into the psychology of the characters mm -hmm. and although myth implies psychology it doesn't spell it out the way shakespeare does so you know you're never getting the hamlet soliloquy um, of a character in the Iliad or the Odyssey. Although, as I said, I, I think that the psychology is all implied. But one of the things that I really love about the novel is that you can dig deep into that story and you can connect those things. You know, who is the type of person who would say all these things? If we take, you know, this version of the myth as the version I'm working with, then how do I connect those stories? How do I psychologically connect those dots? And so it becomes this wonderful and really exciting psychological puzzle almost. Um, how, how can I make this make sense from a character point of view? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's because it's, it's very rare in Homer that we find like interior perspective, right? That when people speak, you know, and so and so with winged words said, and then it's a long speech of 50 lines or so, and then someone responds with a long speech. There's not that kind of interior voice that you get in, in the novel. Um, and, and it's so interesting that Shakespeare figures into this. Um, you're, you're inspiring me to try teaching Troilus and Cressida again, because I tried once in a, in a seminar on the Trojan War and it, it did not go well. So <laughs> it's hard to try again. 
<laughs> it's a hard one to teach. I feel like it's if, but it does have some really great laugh lines. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you're right. The characters are just nasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, coming coming to some of the themes in Cersei, um, and, and I think this also applies to uh, Song of Achilles. Uh, outsiders, um, and you bring these secondary characters, these outsiders, to the forefront. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the way that you bring together Circe and Prometheus. I don't I know if I'm frozen or if you're frozen. <laughs> ah. Oh, sorry. I, 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 you froze for a second for me. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, Kevin, would you just mind saying that again? Yes. Um, the way that you bring outsiders to center stage. Um, and early on in Circe, the connection with Prometheus, I found really intriguing. Um, because like Circe, she, uh, like Circe, Prometheus also has this sympathy for mortals. But I feel like with Prometheus, we don't really know why he does. Um, I don't know if you have an answer to that, but 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 the, the question I really want to ask is, um, what what kind of led you to bringing those two together? I mean, I think it works so well, and it's such um, a great early moment to set up what's going to happen. So I'm going to kind of back up to answer because I I loved writing about Prometheus. Um, and, and, but it, it was not, I didn't go into the story knowing that I was going to write about him. Um, mm. so one of the main things that I do when I am working on a novel is I sort of go, and in this case, I read every version of the Circe story that I could find. And I really tried to kind of burrow down into them and sift through them, um, and see what sort of little things started to generate heat and what were the things that I was really drawn to. And one of the things that really drew me in was this description from Homer of Circe as the dread goddess who speaks like a human mm. and being really, really interested in what it meant to be a goddess who speaks like a human and to sort of think about, well, what does it mean to be a goddess versus what does it mean to be a human? And immediately my brain started working and thinking, well, how do the gods normally speak? Normally when the gods speak to you, they speak in these huge booming voices. And when they speak to you in the ancient world, the blood drains from your body and your hair stands on end. And if it's Zeus speaking to you, you might actually incinerate with his mm -hmm. power. And so if you were a goddess, but you spoke like one of us, you would immediately sort of be an outcast. Um, you would be seen as very weak. You would be kind of on the edges, on the fringes. So I also came to think about the fact that the gods are basically, if we're going to really get, you know, diagnostic about this, they're sociopathic narcissists. Mm -hmm. And if any of you know the ancient myths, you know that for the most part, the gods are absolutely horrible. Um, they're, they're, they have all the faults of humanity, but blown up into the most exaggerated, selfish, capricious, um, petty, and violent form. And so in looking at Circe and her ability to speak like a human, what that came to mean to me as a novelist was that Circe has the capacity for empathy, which most gods lack. She has the ability to, to want to communicate with humans. And so it sort of came to me that the other god who has, who really shows deep empathy um, in the sort of Greek canon is Prometheus. And I had always been interested in the character of Prometheus, but I wanted to be very careful about sort of who Circe met along the way. I didn't want to be just throwing everything at the wall and then there's Pegasus and then there's Hercules. And then, you know, I didn't, I wanted it to all make organic sense and sort of center around her story. But in mythology, Circe's father, Helios, and her grandfather, Oceanus, are two of the great titans. And of course, Prometheus is also a great titan. And their stories are intertwined with Prometheus's story in the ancient world. And so I thought, well, there's an opportunity here. 
her father and her grandfather are already touching Prometheus' story, so I can slip her in there. Um, it made sense to me. And, you know, there's always this moment of, oh my gosh, I'm writing a scene with Prometheus, you know, one of the most famous characters from, from Greek mythology, but it just felt right. And mm -hmm. when I get to a scene like that, I really try to let the characters feel their way through it. You know, I didn't come in with, this is how I want the scene to go. I, I kind of put the characters in the room together and I let them talk to each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, certainly in ancient texts, they love genealogies. <laughs> so it'd only be natural that it, these connections um, would be made. Uh, so thinking about some other parts of the book, and I mean, and there's so many interesting encounters that take place along the way. And of, of course, the moment with Odysseus, um, is, is, is so fascinating and, and so rich. Um, but could we maybe talk about the parts after Odysseus? Because I'm sure you've had lots of questions about, you know, uh, rewriting o Odysseus and, and <laughs> him in a, in a different light. But, um, you know, what happens afterwards is, is I think so fascinating because we, and, and I hope I'm not spoiling the ending for, for those of you who haven't, read this yet um but you know while you know many people at least know of the odyssey right there's these other ancient accounts that aren't very well known and you know we know that there were these other epic poems like uh, that deal with other parts of the of of the story of the trojan war and the return home um but those don't survive and we just have these these brief summaries um, and, you know, so we know that there was this epic poem on the end of Odysseus' life, and in that summary that survives, I mean, all it says is, and Telemachus marries Circe. <laughs> Full stop. That's it. No explanation. Um, so are there, are there other ancient sources that fill out the story, or was this just a blank slate? That then you could build upon and, and run wild with. Um, so it it was kind of a, a blank slate. So so there there were there is another myth sort of about um, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but as you say, it's also you know three thousand years old. So um, that when Odysseus leaves her island, Circe is pregnant with a child, Telegonus, and there are some references to ancient sources where she has multiple children with him. I don't see how that makes sense. He's mm -hmm. only on her island for a year. So yes. I just went with the, you know, I'm always going for the sort of realistic version of the myth. Um, so in, in my version, she just has Telegonus and, and there's this epic called the Telegony that's lost. We only mm -hmm. have sort of brief references and, and a summary of it, as you say. Um, and in it, Telegonus, grows up on the magical island of Aiaia with his mother, raised by his witch mother, and then goes off to find his father when he comes of age and some stuff happens. And then he ends up bringing Penelope, Odysseus's brilliant wife from the Odyssey and Telemachus, Odysseus's son with Penelope back to the island of Aiaia. So I knew that that was waiting for me. And in particular, I knew that the meeting between the two women was waiting for me. I definitely wanted to use that part of the myth. I thought these are two incredibly intelligent women. They're complicated, they're survivors. Most importantly, they're both artists. You know, Circe's witchcraft and her weaving, you know, that's kind of at the core of, of her life. She's a, she's a creator. And same thing with Penelope, that her weaving in the Odyssey is such a, a core part of her. And so I love the fact that they were, they had so much in common. Um, and I, again, I didn't know what was gonna happen when the two of them met. So I was sort of interested to see what happens when I bring these two characters together. But um, in the version of the myth, and I changed the myth somewhat, in one of the versions of the myth that's out there, Circe does marry Telemachus, and then Penelope marries Telegonus. Mm -hmm. So there's like this sun swap thing that happens. I was not interested in the sun swap. Um, right. And I knew I wasn't from the beginning. It just, it, it for me, I there were lots of reasons why that didn't resonate with me. Um, I wanted Penelope's story to end with something that was just about her, because in the Odyssey, there's this sort of obsession with what man she's attached to. And I didn't want to end it, you know, wrapping it up with this bow for Penelope. I wanted her it to be something that was just about her. 
Um, I never saw to like my telegonist, Cersei's son with Odysseus. I never saw him as straight. So luckily, one of the things about these myths is there's always another version. Yeah. And there indeed is a version where he goes off and, and has another different kind of adventure. But um, in terms of Cersei and Telemachus, I really left that a question mark through most of the novel when I was reading it. I thought, I don't know. We'll see. Let's see what, what they have to say to each other when they get there. Um, because I never like to be forcing my characters into things. I feel like that then it starts to feel really false. Um, if if I, as the writer, have an agenda, it has to feel real. And so I never write out of order because I never know what Cersei is going to be in chapter 19 until I've written chapter 18. I'm sort of developing the thread of her personality as I go. And so by the time I got to the scenes with Telemachus, I thought, well, this is interesting. You know, they actually, they have quite a bit to say to each other. They both have extremely difficult fathers. Um, you know, this is a world where Cersei has really struggled with the sexism and with sort of her, you know, being forced into particular roles. But Telemachus has also struggled with that, that he doesn't want to be the classic sort of masculine um, Mycenaean prince hero. You know, he looks at his father's life and he sees blood and death. And he also wants to find a different way. And so the two of them ended up having quite a lot in common. And so I sort of let those scenes evolve because um, I always wanted to make sure that I was being I was being true to the characters and what I felt like the characters would would really do. But I love I mean I love having the space. <laughs> I love having the space to invent and create and embroider. And um, Penelope's what happens to Penelope at the end of the novel, which I will not say. Um, was totally made up. There is absolutely no source for it at all um, in the ancient literature. But when I got there, Penelope was like, this is the ending I would like. So I gave it to him. Yeah. You know, so uh, just thinking about what you're saying about those things that Penelope and Cersei have in common of being survivors, being artists, right? They're both known for their weaving. Um, and also, I mean, mothers, and you know, unlike Song of Achilles, thinking this book has a lot of moments of childbirth. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be uh, something really uh, noticeable here, um, and in particular, some some rather exotic moments of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I really, you, you know, part of my frustration is that in the ancient epics you know, men's lives are epic. Um, and we get more into sort of the details of women's lives in tragedy, which in itself is sort of kind of telling um, uh, about the ancient world. But I really wanted to set a woman's life at the center of, of an epic and to give sort of the, the facts of this particular woman's life their full epic weight. And one of the things that I think is intensely epic is childbirth. Um, it's kind of funny that it often gets shut out of the epic genre um, in the ancient world, but that's because the epic genre was considered, you know, it was it was interested in traditionally male things, warfare, vengeance, inheritance, those types of things. And so childbirth, which was considered traditionally female, was not important enough for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to make sure that, you know, parenting is epic. It is a life or death situation. <laughs> it is, you know, if you've ever sort of been, whether you've given birth yourself or supported someone through it or visited someone who's just given birth, I mean, you are literally bringing a, a new being into the world. What could be more epic than that? Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't want to just fly by those moments. I wanted them to have real weight. Um, and the other things of, of sort of ancient women's lives. So, you know, craft work and gardening and you know the type of artistry that oftentimes gets sort of put aside as as women's work but you know really centering that and and giving it its full weight so it was very important to me to have to have those birth scenes and also they were they were a lot of fun i mean i don't know if any of you have experienced this but i i find that oftentimes birth scenes um women's birth scenes in movies and TV shows are just incredibly inadequate. <laughs> I feel like they are really uh, false representations. And so I wanted to, you know, Cersei ends up having sort of a little bit of trauma in, in hers. Um, but I, I wanted there to be real, you know, stakes and, and real mess and real, 
you know, all, all of that stuff. Um, and then of course there is also a, a Minotaur birth scene, yeah. which as an author is pretty much the apex getting to write one of those, so. <laughs> yes, yes, because I mean, you know, we, we hear about the Minotaur in so many sources, but you know, rarely do we hear about its actual birth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this is an example of sort of, I feel like that the focus on, in the Minotaur is always on, you know, Minos or it's on Theseus mm -hmm. or Daedalus or, you know, the monster, even sometimes you get Ariadne as the focus, but so, I mean, basically never do you see the mom as the focus. And it feels like that's a big omission to me anyway, that, you know, who is this incredibly intense woman who brought the Minotaur into the world? <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean this this is this has been so fascinating and and uh before i ask any more questions um i know that some of the high school students from bishop fian have some questions for you so i want to hand it over to them um so that they can ask you some questions as well excellent so i am now grabbing kaylee kaylee i'm inviting you on the screen so you can ask your question and you just accept it and jump up on the screen and you can ask your question. Excellent. There you go. Hey, Kaylee. Hi. Hi. My question is, are any of the characters based on someone you know and do you relate to or like any of the characters, especially Cersei? Mm, great question. Um, my characters are not based on anyone I know. Um, I, I, a lot of writers write that way that has just never sort of been how I how I conceptualized any of the characters. Um, but I do, I mean, I lived with Cersei in my head for seven years as I was writing this novel. That's how long it, it took me. And she was a wonderful companion. Um, and I, I loved that she was difficult um, and she made mistakes. But one of the things that I, I really admired about Cersei that sort of was in many ways an animating force of the novel for me is the fact that Cersei never gives up. She always tries to do better. Um, and in particular with her parenting, she makes plenty of parenting mistakes, but at the end of the day, she says, how can I do better tomorrow? And I, I really admired that about her. And so living with a character like that for seven years, I, I, I do feel it changed me somehow. And I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I can put my finger on it, but I certainly, um, I don't know if I could live in my head with, um, say, I don't know, pacify might be tough to live with for, <laughs> for seven years, but, but living with Cersei was, was very enjoyable. Wow, that is great. Okay, now I'm going to invite Dory. Thank you for that great question, Kaylee. Okay, so Dory, I sent you an invitation and hopefully you will be jumping in. Oh. Excellent. Hey, Dory. Hi. Hello. So my question is, how did you, how did you tie in modern ideas such as woman's position in society into the novel? Um, I mean, I really just, unfortunately, uh, I think there are a lot of things that we are still grappling with that they were grappling with in the ancient world. You know, women being silenced and women being belittled and kept from the halls of power, treated as objects unfortunately suffering assault. I mean, these are all things that are that are still with us. I, I really didn't feel like I had to kind of shoehorn any of that in. I felt like it was, it was all there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of bring out as I was writing about Cersei is how, is sort of her evolving understanding of, of how that misogyny, that hostility to women um, plays out around her. And I, I wanted her to deal with um, some internalized misogyny, which is something I think we see a lot today, which is where, you know, as a woman growing up in a society that's hostile to women, you yourself have some hostility towards women that's kind of gets programmed in there. And so the Glaucus episode where she lashes out at Scylla, even though her anger and her pain is really directed at Glaucus, I wanted to be sort of an example of that internalized misogyny. So looking at something like that would be an example of, of kind of wanting to really draw that connection between the modern and the ancient world. But, um, but you know, that myth already existed. I didn't feel like I had to, you know, I didn't have to create it. It was already there. It was just kind of about letting those moments breathe. 
Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we are bringing, whoop, where am I going there? Bringing B on the stage. Yes. All right. B, yep, here she comes. Excellent. This is fun. I love seeing the students on the screen with you. <laughs> Hi. Me too. Hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, and you kind of talked about this earlier on in the video, in the conference, um, what sparked your interest in Greek mythology? Like, were you interested in it when you were young, like our age? And um, how much research did you do during the writing process and like before the writing process? Great question. Um, so I did. I loved it in high school. I I started reading um, Latin and I, I kind of, I'm going to be totally brutally honest here. The first couple years of Latin are a lot of memorization. And we started with Caesar, who now I can really appreciate Caesar as a stylist, but I could not then. Um, but my teacher said to me, just hang on till you get to Virgil. So I hung on. And Virgil was a life-changing author for me, reading Virgil in Latin. He is such a powerful poet filled with so much subtext, so much beauty, um, so much pushing back against a, you know, a dictator um, in the Aeneid that I, I, I just kind of fell in love with the poetry. And then my teacher offered to teach me Greek. And so I started reading um, the Iliad in Greek with him. And I thought I had loved it, but but hearing the language and really experiencing the poetry was so thrilling. So I, I really kind of knew from then on that I wanted to study it, but I also knew that I wanted to kind of question it and, and push back against it um, and sort of explore things that people weren't talking about, which is why, you know, looking at my first novel was about Achilles and Patroclus as lovers, which was something that now I think is is much more talked about. But when I was going through school, it was like you might get it in a footnote of one commentary out of twenty. Um, you know, whereas it was a totally established tradition in the ancient world. You know, as a way to interpret them as lovers. So it really came from this sort of dual falling in love, but also wanting wanting to to kind of question it and feeling like that there's so much there's so much resonance between the ancient world and the modern world and wanting to kind of do battle with that but also open up that world thank you so much awesome okay so we're inviting jess thank you thanks b all right so jessica's invited and she will be joining you in just a minute and then we've got emma all right accepting and connecting there we go. Hi. Hello. Um, my question to you is, did poetry influence any of your writing? Absolutely. I love poetry. Um, I don't actually write poetry myself, but I love to read. Um, I love to read poetry. And oftentimes, in fact, I start, I start my writing day with reading sort of a, a random poem from somewhere. Um, Dr. Kalish uh, referenced this, but Louise Gluck just won the Nobel Prize um, for her poetry. And I absolutely love her writing. She's she's a beautiful poet. Um, so I, I am, you know, whether it's Latin poetry or Greek poetry or lots and lots and lots of English poetry, I, I love it. Because I think that po what poetry does is really, it does the same thing that a novel does, but it does it in this amount of space. And so every word in a poem has to be load bearing. Every word in a poem has to be, you know, doing all these different things. And so it reminds me reading poetry that, you know, I need to make every word count. I need to make sure that every word is, is belongs there and is doing what it needs to do. So it just helps remind me of sort of the potency of individual words and not to waste a lot of words. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Jess. All right, and now we have Emma. I should invite people faster. I just told Jeff how fast I was pulling people up on the screen and I just jinxed myself. <laughs> <laughs> Doing great. <laughs> awesome. Emma, you coming? And then the next person after that will be Brennan Schiffman. So Brennan, if you're there, if you could just say hello in the chat and I will bring you up next. Awesome. Hey, Emma. Hello. hello. Um, so I was wondering, you touched on this a little bit earlier about your writing process, but I was wondering how strict your planning process is when it comes to writing a book. Like, do you already know the plot ahead of time? Um, so with Circe, I knew 
I actually knew the ending that I wanted. Um, and I knew kind of four basic, I, I knew that there were four basic myths that I wanted to use that I sort of saw as like these structural pillars holding up the, the novel. That was the Glaucus episode, the Odyssey, the scene from the Odyssey where she meets Odysseus. Um, also, oh, sorry, before that, the scene where she meets Medea, which comes from an ancient source. And then the Telegony, where at the end she meets Telemachus and Penelope. So those were kind of the four basic things. Um, and then I knew the ending. But the thing that took me the first five years of writing was actually, I had no idea what the beginning was. I didn't know how to start the novel. Um, and I didn't know lots of things about it. Like I had no idea how many siblings Cersei was gonna have. In some sources she has um, three siblings and in some sources she has two, which completely changes, I thought, the dynamic of the family, whether you have four children or three children. So that was something that took me a lot of thinking. Um, so I, I, other than that, and I, I don't outline, I always feel bad admitting that, um, some writers do, but I, I think it was Russell Banks who says that um, you can sort of go through, it's like driving on a highway at night, you turn on the headlights and you can only see the section of the road that the headlights illuminate, but you can make the whole trip that way, because as you move forward, the, the light moves forward with you. So I sort of feel like I, I write a little bit like that, um, other than knowing my final destination and sort of those markers along the way. Wow, that Thank is you. awesome. That was a great question. Thank you, Emma. No, Jessica. Jess, right? Emma. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Emma. And now Brennan is coming up. We're talking in the chat. He's very excited to ask his question. See, I jinxed it. <laughs> you're doing amazing. I, I could definitely not be doing all this <laughs> that you're doing. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, Brennan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. All right. Uh, continuing on like the process line of questioning. Um, on a productive day, um, like what's your process of getting work done? How much do you write? Yeah. Great question. Um, and actually, this goes back. I which I totally I, I didn't fully answer before about the research. Um, so sometimes the productive day is just me researching and thinking. And that counts for me um, because oftentimes I, I need more research to kind of move ahead with the story. So in the morning, you know, I get up and I try and put in kind of a, a good chunk of writing in the morning. Then I like to take a break and go for a walk or work out in some way. Um, it's actually incredibly helpful. I find that moving my body helps to clear my mind. And then I come home and I write down all the things I thought about <laughs> while I was working out or walking. And um, then oftentimes I'll work also sort of at midnight, 11 p.m. after the whole house has, has gone to sleep. Some writers like to set a word limit per day. I don't because I do a ton of deleting. Um, and so I actually had to, my mom used to ask me, oh, how many, how many words did you write today? How many pages did you write? And I had to, you know, tell her to stop asking me that because oftentimes I would say like, well, I deleted 50 pages. And my mom would say, oh no, you know, that's a disaster. But it wasn't a disaster because those 50 pages had to go. And so part of sort of getting into um, getting into a novel is going down those false paths, realizing that they're false path, figuring out what you learned from taking that false path and then backing up and trying another way. So I don't even at this point view those, you know, 50 pages as, that I'm throwing out as a failure. It's just kind of part, part of the process. Um, but I try to work, you know, when I'm really, really dug into the story, I'm, I'm trying to work for several hours every day. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen. And, you know, in, in that case, I'll do a lot of thinking about it and I'll do some research. But, um, but when I'm really, really working, I'm, I'm working several hours a day. Oh, that was great. Great question, Brennan. Thank so we you. actually have a couple of questions from the audience that I will read out before um, we bring Dr. Kalish back up. Um, the first is from Sam. What are some of your favorite stories about women from Greek mythology? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, I love Clytemnestra. She's one of my favorite, favorite characters. I love how she haunts. Clytemnestra is Agamemnon's wife. Um, and she, when he comes home after the Trojan War, uh, after having been an absolutely horrendous leader and a huge pain to everybody, 
um, she murders him in the bathtub with an ax. Uh, and he's there's a lot of backstory there. He has sacrificed their daughter. So, you know, if ever anyone, I, I don't want to advocate for murdering people in bathtubs with axes, but if ever anyone deserved it, it was Agamemnon. And I, I feel like Clytemnestra is really, really just a, a fascinating figure. It's sort of this, this maternal figure, this figure of anger. Um, such a lightning rod in in the ancient world you know people hated her they loved her so there are a lot of characters i'm often drawn to sort of the the women who are cast as villains so clytemnestra medea also one of the you know the other great witch of ancient literature um i love the story of cassandra i find it incredibly incredibly moving um you know this woman who is trying to tell the truth and no one will listen to her over and over and over again talk about a story that i feel like resonates today um, I mean, Andromache, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the stories that really don't get told are actually the, the enslaved characters, particularly in the Odyssey. Um, Eurycleia, who is often referred to as Odysseus's nurse, but she's enslaved. And, um, her story I'm really interested in. It doesn't get told. I mean, I, I started this talk by talking about sort of nostos and how, um, the Odyssey is all about Odysseus longing for his homecoming. But what's amazing is that the enslaved characters, none of them get homecoming. They've all been taken away from their home and are now living in Ithaca. And so underneath Odysseus's story, there's sort of all these sub stories um, that are really, really interesting and in many ways undermining Odysseus's story. So those are just a few, but basically I think any woman from ancient literature could, could make a fascinating novel of her own. Yes, absolutely. So Lexi would like to know, is there a mythology from other parts of the world that you would like to adapt? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I think I would have to learn the languages first because I like to work so closely to the material. I really, really feel like I need to know the language. Um, I love Egyptian mythology. Um, I love the, um, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. I love Norse mythology and the sagas, but I don't speak any of those, <laughs> any of those languages or, or read any of them. And so maybe at some point I, I would, I would, one of the, the great regrets of my life is that I did not take hieroglyphics in college. Um, so for all of you who are still heading into college, there's still a chance to reverse my, my mistake. Um, so I think I just enjoy those as a reader and not necessarily as a writer. That is fantastic. Um, okay, so Amelia has a question. When adapting these stories, how do you decide which parts will get to stay in your version or which parts will have to be changed? Mm. This is where the novelist takes over. And this is really <laughs> the difference between being a novelist and you know writing a, an academic paper. And one of the things that is not different between being a novelist and writing an academic paper is creativity. I think both take tremendous creativity. And I felt like when I was writing academic papers, I was using my creative mind all the time. But in an academic paper, you have to include everything. You have to you know, account for every source, every variation, um, and look at all of that. Whereas as a novelist, you just have to talk about the things that resonate with you and that sort of support the story that you're telling. There are plenty of sort of side myths about Cersei um, that I felt like I was not that interested in. One is where she turns this guy into a woodpecker. That story <laughs> didn't speak to me, <laughs> so I just didn't tell it. And um, and there are also stories where I feel like I was pushing back against the story or, or shifting it. Um, for example, the love triangle with Glaucus and Scylla, I, I kind of shifted around and I, I gave Cersei more reason for feeling um, as upset as she feels. I sort of gave her a little bit more psychological depth there, her motivations. So, you know, it's, it's just a, a question of, of feeling your way through it and sort of saying what makes sense here? What is, what's the story I'm trying to tell? What serves the character's story? There are still moments where the academic in me or the maybe just the nerd in me <laughs> wants to include other versions of stories. You know, I love the character of Hector um, and his wife Andromache. And I think that in many ways they are the real heroes of the Iliad, um, much more so than any of the Greeks. They're the, they're the, Hector is the great Trojan prince. Um, the one who's actually defending his family and his home from the invading Greeks. And when I was writing Song of Achilles, I, I had to 
really resist the impulse to keep putting Hector and Andromache, his wife, in. Um, and I finally had to say to myself, you know, you are telling this story from Patroclus's perspective. He has one fatal encounter with Hector and that's it. <laughs> so that's, that's the Hector that you get. And, you know, once I kind of realized that I would be destroying the story if I was trying to shoehorn Hector in, in any other place, then I was able to let go of it. So, you know, it's always keeping in mind that I need to be serving this character's voice and this character's story. Wow, that is awesome. Thank you. So now I'm going to welcome Dr. Kalish back up. Hello. Hello again. Uh, wow, that was such excellent questions from the high school students. Uh, so invigorating. Um, and, and I hope all the students out there heard, you know, Madeline Miller said her great regret is that she did not study <laughs> so, have a chance to study hieroglyphics, study hieroglyphics. And if you don't have a chance to study hieroglyphics, study Latin, study Greek, study the humanities. So uh, my, my plea for, for the humanities um, is we all, we all hear of the, the crisis of the humanities, but I think events like this remind us that um, the humanities are really what keep us going um, in these in these difficult times. Um, so I guess to wrap things up, um, maybe one last question. Sure. Um, and so uh, my final question, um, if I were to guess, and based on what you were saying a little bit earlier, uh, Virgil is probably next and Dido maybe? <laughs> <laughs> You, you, that is a very, very good guess. Um, so Virgil is definitely down the line. I think before Virgil, I may take a small detour into Shakespeare, um, you know, the other great, great love of my life. And so uh, I love directing all of Shakespeare's plays except one, which is The Tempest. So that's the one I want to write about. <laughs> mm. um, so I'm going to, and The Tempest is also, you know, magic and witches and islands. So there's kind of a natural continuity with Circe there. But uh, so hopefully, hopefully The Tempest and then Virgil, Virgil next, because I would, I would love to write in his world. But I completely agree with you, Dr. Kalish, about, um, about the humanities. You know, humans are, we are built to tell stories, to make sense of the world and to make sense of our lives. And the humanities helps us understand those stories and, and why we tell the stories that we tell and how other people have told those stories. Well, I, I'm sure we will all be eagerly awaiting um, your work on The Tempest and, and on Virgil. And um, I mean, what what an honor this has been to uh, be to be part of this and to, to have this conversation e even remotely, even virtually. So um, thank you. This, is, this has been really wonderful. Oh, yes. thank you so much. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Thank you to all the students out there for your wonderful questions. This was truly such a pleasure. I am really, I'm, I'm honored to get to be here and speak with all of you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and for those great questions. And you can click the link to purchase the books if you haven't read them already. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kalish. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Chris. This has been fantastic.